Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks very much for the invitation. Much appreciated and it's very nice to be back here. Spent a, a year here about 20 years ago and uh, very much enjoyed it. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Ricci flow, but certainly, although this is a big subject, um, it won't be necessary to know anything about Ricci flow at all. Um, in fact, the content of what I want to talk about is you can think of as being focused on a very simple partial differential equation, the so-called um, logarithmic fast diffusion equation. And this is simply the equation du by dt is <coughs> Laplacian of log u. So this is for functions, positive functions, from, let's say, some domain in R2. You'll see a little bit more later. OK, so this is a uh, very heavily studied equation. <coughs> very, uh, very elegant properties of the solution, I would say. Really very, very nice equation. And the way I see the subject, the reason for all these nice properties is that the equation is very linked to this particularly natural equation, the Ricci flow equation. So let me uh, just say a couple of words about that. So <coughs> the setup is that we want to work now on a, a surface, not necessarily R2 or part of R2, but just take a, um, just some smooth surface. Let's call it M. So then a Ricci flow, I'll just write RF. So a Ricci flow is a one parameter family of Riemannian metrics. So G of T, let's say. So T varying over some time interval. So each point on the surface, just an inner product, just a way of measuring distances. And it, of course, solves a PDE. And the PDE is <coughs> dg by dt is, well, in high dimensions, it would be minus 2 times the Ricci curvature of g. So because we're working on surfaces, that simplifies very nicely to minus 2 times the Gauss curvature times g. So K is the Gauss curvature. OK. So an example maybe would be if you had M to be a sphere and <coughs> you started the Ricci flow with a round metric, then that would have constant Gauss curvature. It would just be shrinking and it would shrink um, it would shrink to nothing in finite time. In fact, this is going to be relevant. Even though it's a bit of a banal example, it will be relevant in a, in a second. So it would actually shrink to nothing in at time a half. <coughs> so what's the connection here between these two equations? Well, it's very simple. So um, <coughs> on M, you can pick special coordinates so-called isothermal coordinates, of course, so that g can be written locally as just some positive number times the Euclidean metric, which let's just write it as a tensor like this. So locally, it would just be Euclidean space where distances are formed by um, u to the half, that would be. okay. <coughs> So the area of the surface would be the integral of u locally. <coughs> and so the connection then is that um, g of t being a Ricci flow is equivalent to u solving this logarithmic fast diffusion equation. So I'm not really saying that these equations are equivalently uh, uh, equivalent. I'm saying this is being solved in each coordinate chart. Okay. 
Right. So, so part of the motivation for the new estimates that I want to um, explain today is to try and understand the topic of how do we run the Ricci flow starting with an initial data which is not necessarily just a smooth Riemannian surface. Okay, So we'll want to to start the Ricci flow with a, a rough object. So you're all familiar with this sort of idea from other PD. Um, uh, the rough object we might want to start with uh, might not be something of sort of Sobolev regularity or you know something similar to that. It might actually be that we want to start with a certain metric space. But in reality, so sort of, sort of just to give you some morals of the story, uh, what that will amount to in many situations is that we want to basically start this equation with L1 initial data. So I'll come back to that in a second. Anyway, before we do anything um, rough, let's have a look at the smooth situation. So although Ricci flow in two dimensions is um, by far the simplest situation for Ricci flow, um, there's been a fair amount of development over the last few years and actually showing that the well posedness theory is dramatically better than it is for higher dimensions. So there are lots of um, contributions over decades, but the, uh, I'll, I'll maybe say a little bit about the earlier results <coughs> after the theorem. But the theorem in this form is due to Gregor Giesen and myself from 2011, and the uniqueness part will be due to me from last year. And it says the following. So let's suppose we have um, let's suppose we have a smooth uh, connected, I won't write that down, just assume that smooth connected uh, Riemannian surface M G zero. Well, I want to run a Ricci flow from that, but um, because this is going to be quite a general result, let me actually point out how general before I, I write anything else down. So we're not assuming that this is a closed surface. We're not assuming that it has bounded curvature. We're not even assuming that it's complete. Okay, so really just anything. So suppose we start off with this Riemannian surface, <coughs> then there exists a unique Ricci flow. Let's call it um, G of t for t at some time interval, such that, so the conditions are, of course, that we satisfy the initial data. And the second condition is that g of t is complete. Obviously not at time zero, because we're not assuming that, but for all t after time zero. So it's kind of important here. <coughs> I'm not including zero. So that seems like, well, existence and uniqueness, but it's kind of a little bit weird if you think about it, because this is really including, <coughs> this is dealing with an equation which typically has a lot of non-uniqueness, <coughs> and it's dealing with some situations that you um, don't normally consider. Uh, so I'll give you some examples in a second. Maybe I'll continue to say. So without completeness, you might not have uniqueness, or how does it work? So without completeness, you certainly don't, in two here, you don't have uniqueness, that's right, for sure. Yeah, so, um, so, so maybe just that sort of maybe prompt the discussion a little bit here. So let's say I started off with a, um, a just a flat disk. That's a, that's a smooth Riemannian surface. So open flat disk. So you could keep that as a flat disk. That's a Ricci flow. Uh, it's not complete. Um, you could also write down the equation. Well, we've already seen that this is the equation. 
That's a nice parabolic equation. I can specify boundary data and look for as many solutions as I want that are smooth up to the boundary. So there's very extreme non-uniqueness in that situation. Theorem says there's a unique, complete solution starting with a flat disk. So, of course, it's not complete. Initially, you can get to the boundary. You can get to infinity in a distance one, so in particular in a finite distance. So something has to change dramatically. These are all smooth Ricci flows. So the solution blows up at the boundary then? Exactly. So the, the solution would blow up in the, at the boundary. So um, here's your disk, and then initially your u there would just be zero. Uh, sorry, it would just be one. And then for a little time, it would have, have to blow up so that if you were to integrate square root of u out to the infinity, if you like, out to the boundary, then you'd have to get infinity. So there'd have to be a certain rate of blow up immediately to make it complete. In fact, this would have a geometric picture. This would be in a thin boundary layer around the disk. That would be the hyperbolic metric of curvature minus 1 on 2t. Okay. Peter, are you, are you saying that your choice of boundary data is unique then in getting this solution? What's the boundary data here? It's infinity. But different rates could be? Uniqueness. That's the whole point of the 2015 paper. Always, always unique. So we're feeding data in. We're fe feeding heat in from infinity. Okay, so, um, so you're sort of ticking off in a star. You're getting something that isn't just a flat disk. Well, that's not totally unreasonable, but there's only one way you can do it. If you didn't put as much heat in from infinity, you would fail to get completeness. The blow-up rate would not be strong enough. If you put more, if you tried to put more in, that would fail because it's the more you put in, the higher it blows up, then there's a damping you're getting in the equation because of this nonlinearity here. So it might actually be instructive to look at the equation for v, which is half log u, and that satisfies the equation dtv is e to the minus 2v Laplacian v. So as v increases, you're really slowing down the diffusion. So that is giving you then uniqueness. But of course, the theorem is not just saying if you start with a flat disk, you have a solution. It's saying you start with anything. It could be the worst fractal, whatever, boundary growth, I don't know what. You will always get a solution and always only one. I guess my question is, you're not allowed to put in twice as much heat on the left as on the right. Still comes out unique. Unique, that's right. Unless you're willing to fail the test of completeness. So in, in a sense, it's giving you well posedness to this equation, which is always a bit of a conundrum. There are a lot, a lot of papers on this that I'll come back to in a few moments, but uh, uniqueness is always a bit of a, a, bit of a gray area. Uh, this uh, unique solution, uh, is it, uh, can, it can be seen as a limit uh, of the solution which I'm not complete? Uh, you could in this situation, right. In this situation, it would happen that um, you could, for instance, take fixed boundary data equal to some constant and then increase that constant. But look, that is a situation where you can actually make sense of a boundary. I don't care if you take a fractal set. Okay, no boundary to, you know, I don't want to talk about boundary, da boundary data, I don't want to talk about boundary in general. It's not even true that you get asymptotically your conform factor going to infinity. So it's not a, a question of sort of setting everything to infinity on the boundary. That's just not true. Sometimes you have a, you know, on Euclidean space, it would just stay Euclidean space. Conformal factor would just stay one, for instance. What are the asymptotics of you at the boundary? Oh, so the... <coughs> Um, in this situation, that's what I was saying a, a second ago, that it would look like in a, in a boundary layer whose thickness you could say, depending on time, it would look like a Poincaré metric scaled homothetically so that the curvature was minus 1 on 2t. That's for you, sorry? I'm pl plotting here, you. Yeah. Sort of. A hyperbolic metric is for g. Gt. And what's the other? Yeah, so, so I, I just mean the U corresponding to the hyperbolic metric. So um, the hyperbolic metric would be corresponding to 2 over 1 minus um, mod x squared. squared. 
and then just scale that. So there is some kind of your uniformization at the boundary, right? There's a you, you, you're going to prompt me to give a different talk here, which is um, that the Ricci flow does uniformization for you in this case. That's kind of amazing to me that you, you start off with any metric on a, on, a, on a surface like this that supports a hyperbolic metric, and it will flow to it in the sense that it will converge asymptotically. If you divide them g of t by 2t to renormalize, because everything's expanding in the hyperbolic set setting, if you just renormalize by dividing by 2t, it will converge smoothly locally to the unique uniformization metric, the unique hyperbolic metric. But only smoothly locally, because in general, uh, maybe I'll write that down. So in general, the, um, <coughs> the curvature supremum is inf infinity a little bit later, or initially, or whatever. So it's not regularizing you to a hyperbolic metric um, sort of uniformly. Uh, this is a couple of words about the, uh, the t. So the t is explicit, the existence time. Uh, so basically, normally, t equals infinity. The, there are exceptions, which maybe I'll just say out loud. Um, S2, obviously, because S2 just sh a round S2 shrinks to nothing, and even a wobbly S2 will shrink to, a you know, eventually become round and shrink to nothing. That's the theorem of Hamilton and uh, Chow, <coughs> which is sort of part of the dot, dot, dot. Um, and also, if, if you're uh, conformally the plane, C, if you're conformally the plane, I don't mean if the universal cover, is conformally the plane, sorry to diverge this way, but if you're conformally the plane, so if you're working in R2, then you can have also um, flows where everything disappears in a finite time. So for instance, give you another cute example, just take the sphere, but remove one point. So this is no longer conformally the sphere, it's conformally the plane by stereographic projection, it will just map it to the plane. And it's no longer complete, because you can get outside the surface in a finite distance, if you go towards this puncture. So this says there's a, a unique flow, and that what will happen is it will develop a hyperbolic cusp straight away. And on the other hand, the bulb here will just sort of shrink to nothing um, in a finite time. And you can analyze the asymptotics. In fact, Manuel was one of the people that uh, did this sort of analysis. Very, it's very, uh, very interesting stuff. OK, let's not go that way right now then. Okay, so um, maybe I'll mention some more names involved in this. So um, <coughs> in the closed case, then the existence of a flow and, and uniqueness, in fact, is due to Hamilton from 1982. Um, in the case where you're, you have like uh, completeness and bounded curvature, then there's a flow due to Xi, existence, um, but it doesn't as last as long as ours in general. It only got lasts until the curvature blows up, whereas for us the curvature does blow up in general and you just keep going. Um, the uniqueness in the, in the bounded curvature complete case is due to Chen and Zhu. There's an, uh, a shorter proof due to Kochvar, which I would recommend. Um, existence also overlaps with existence theory for this equation, which is a huge literature, but I think the main results are the existence theory in R2, and uh, we've got papers of uh, Daskalopoulos and Del Pino, uh, De Benedetto and Dilla, and Vasquez, Esteban, Rodriguez, and sure, surely more, more besides. So it's a, there's a big literature, but I think everything is subsumed into uh, this result, of which we, we use some of the, uh, the earlier theory to get this. Okay, <coughs> so we want to talk about um, flowing with rougher initial data. Okay, so as I s alluded to a little bit earlier, what you really need to do is try and flow this with L1 data. So we have to talk about um, trying to prove what's normally called L1, L infinity 
smoothing estimates. So what that really means is if you start off with L1 initial data, then do you get L infinity bounds at a later time, depending on the L1 data and the time? OK, so you know, for the ordinary heat equation, so let's do L1, L infinity smoothing. So for the ordinary linear heat equation, of course, this is trivial. So if you don't have the nonlinearity, then you know you can write u as a represent in terms of the representation formula that you learn in first year undergrad. So you get a convolution of the heat kernel and um, and the initial data. So immediately you can bound that by um, <coughs> the the size of this and the uh, the size of this just using Hilda. So, um, so you'd get a, uh, a bound like um, 4 pi t. So in the, in the, to some power, I'll just work out in a second. So u0 in Lp. So this would be, for p is 1, it would be minus n on 2. So in general, I think it's at minus n on 2p, We're just using Hilda. So the key point here is that p equals 1 works. So I'll do it for all p. But uh, that's the key point. So the, of course, the extreme case is when you start with a delta function, and it smooths out. And that, the reason I'm telling you this sort of baby stuff is that that's exactly what fails for the logarithmic fast diffusion equation. And the moral of the story is that if you start with a delta function, then you flow staying as a delta function. Okay because of the nonlinearity. So the way to view this <coughs> is to um, think geometrically again. So um, what are we going to do? We're going to go back to this uh, <coughs> shrinking sphere example here. So let's take, so, so just to clarify here, G here is the round unit sphere for this normalization to work. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these nice local isothermal coordinates, just using stereographic projection, and I'm going to write down my u, so therefore I get a solution. OK, so let's um, maybe do that over here. So the shrinking sphere. Ricci flow, you can write down as, um, where have I written it down? So what I'm going to do is uh, give it some notation. I'm going to write u0, but I'm also going to put an extra parameter in here. And um, <coughs> you'll see why in a second, because so I'm going to modify this in, just in a second. So this would be the metric of the shrinking sphere. But of course, instead of just taking stereographic coordinates, I could take stereographic coordinates and then just pull back the metric by dilation. So that amounts just to changing this a little bit. I'd end up with a lambda here, a lambda squared here. In fact, we saw that in the last talk, hidden, hidden away there. But this is the metric of the sphere, of course. So um, lambda is just some positive number. So because it's totally obvious that this is a solution to the Ricci flow just by inspection, I immediately get a solution here without actually having to compute the Laplacian of log of it. Um, it will just scale. So this gives you the solution u lambda t. So that would just be 1 minus 2t u0 lambda. OK, so why, why am I telling you this? Well, of course, I want to take the limit as lambda goes to infinity. And if you do that, then you get um, this mass of 4 pi mass of uh, area would just concentrate at the origin. So u0 lambda would converge to the delta function. And then the um, u lambda of t will be converging to not a sp nice spreading out Gaussian, but just still 
a scale delta function. Okay? So in some sense, diffusion in Ricci flow or logarithmic fast diffusion equation is happening relative to itself. You should just think of it that way. Okay, so in particular, it's not true that if you uh, give me the, uh, oops, if you give me the L1 norm and the time, you can't get an infinity estimate. So, you know, of course, u0 lambda and L1 is just 4 pi, it's the area of the sphere. <coughs> but the uh, u lambda t, the size of that at the origin, let's write it like that, is just 1 minus 2t times 4 lambda squared. So this is going to infinity for um, as lambda goes to infinity with fixed t, of course. Right? So, so, so basically the moral is normally interpreted as, so this is normally interpreted as the fact that there's no L1, L, L infinity smoothing. So, although the point of the lecture today is to actually prove an L1, L infinity smoothing estimate. So you'll see where the, where the catch is in a second. Save that one. Um, right. So let, let me let me say what I'm raising. Why this is a, why this is actually a problem. So you know, to go back to the motivation, we want to start the Ricci flow for an, quite a few reasons with rough data. So what you would expect to do would be to take a rough data, this sort of time-honored tradition, approximated by smooth data, run the smooth data, but prove a priori estimates on the smooth flows from the smooth data, and then pass the limit of the flows. So that's the usual strategy. So in some sense, the estimate that you require to make to get the, the right CK a priori estimates on, on the on the solutions is exactly an L1, L infinity smoothing estimate, apparently. You know, once you have L infinity control on solutions of this equation, then you can use De Georgian Nash Mose and Schauder to just get any CK estimate and, and you're away. So Peter, mm -hmm. if, if you consider the, the maximal solutions and the problem in the phase space, what you are saying is that if you, if you do this procedure of concentrating the Initial condition, you get the infinity estimates after uniform infinity estimates. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no. So I have not written down a claim yet. Uh, all I've said is what doesn't work. So I'll write down a theorem in a minute, and you'll see what we can prove. But uh, let me let me just say another thing that is is known, uh, which is that um, so the closest existing result is uh, the LP. L infinity smoothing for P strictly bigger than 1. So um, that is due to, um, uh, not so completely clear, but there's a, a, a nice paper of De Benedetto and Diller where they used De Georgi iteration to make this work. And there's other work of Vath Vathquez, which may have been earlier, I'm not sure, um, where he uses symmetrization techniques. To, to make this work. So you, you can symmetrize and then reduce to one dimension, which is um, uh, then easier to handle. OK, so in, in some sense, what this is saying, you, you know, if you're an LP, you're a little bit more spread out somehow. You controlled how concentrated you are. And the moral you should take away maybe is that you know, once you've spread out a bit, then you've got all the diffusion is happening relative to itself. And then once you spread out a little bit, then it really gets going and you really get diffusion. Okay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this result is actually not very useful for applications because you just, in geometric applications, you just don't have LP control in your initial data. You know, just basic, the basic situation would be that you have L1 data. You know, many of the metrics you would end up considering as maybe limits of smooth metrics with certain curvature conditions would end up having singularities like a hyperbolic cusp, for instance. You could approximate that by metrics of curvature bounded below, 
for instance. And a hyperbolic cusp, when you write it in coordinates, would be in L1, but not in any LP. Okay, so what we need to do is find a, uh, an L1 L infinity smoothing, which by this cannot exist in the traditional sense. So here's the idea. So normal L1 L infinity smoothing says, you give me the L1 data, and you give me the time, and I'm going to give you L infinity bound, okay, which is false. What we're going to do is you give me the bound that you want, and you give me L1 data, let's say, and I'll give you the time you have to wait. Okay, so it's a little bit twisted round. And just by making that little twist around, it actually makes everything work. So let's write down a, a theorem, and you'll see how it goes. So this is the first theorem, which is the sort of uh, straight PD result. And then there's this little variation on that, which is the more geometric result. So this is with uh, Hao Yin. We proved it a few months ago and it's going to submit it soon. So let's suppose we have a, uh, a solution to this logarithmic fast diffusion equation. We're going we're gonna to do it on the ball. Okay, so this here is the unit ball in R2. So suppose this solves this equation over here. So it's probably just easier to write it down. <clears throat> and let's say with initial data u0 in L1 of the ball. I'm not making any assumptions about what happens as you approach the boundary of the ball. You could be smooth up to the boundary, you could be totally crazy up to the boundary. Okay, so what's the conclusion? So then, don't get distracted by this. A delta is going to be a bit of a, a, a red herring. It's just to make it super sharp. So for all k, this is going to be, you remember, you're going to give me the upper bound, and I'm going to give you the time you have to flow for. Think of roughly the k, or some scale version of k, as being the upper bound. So for any upper bound k, <coughs> and t, well, I have to specify the t. So t such that, so I'm going to say, once you're at a certain time, we're going to get a good L infinity bound. So what is that time? Well, the time you have to wait is given by, I'm going to take the, uh, the difference, u0 minus k, and just take the positive part. Okay, measure it in L1. And that is the time, modulo a factor of 4 pi. And then wait a little bit longer, depending on delta. So for all this, and t such that that, we have, and then morally, the estimate is saying, we're now below the bound k, although I'm going to put ck. If you want, you can replace key k by k over c. And I'm also going to notice that if I make t really large, then a different phenomenon kicks in. You know, I might have a hyperbolic guy that's sort of expanding and making this big, so I better add a, a t here. But that's sort of negligible for small time. And c is depending on delta. OK, so that's the, uh, the first theorem here. So the 4 pi is, I mean, the, 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 this is sharp. You can't do any better than this. There are various ways of seeing that. Um, <coughs> you can give an example. It's actually not the shrinking sphere. So the shrinking sphere is saying, you know, you're like a delta function, but only until time half. Okay, and then you've got brilliant bounds. You're actually zero. So um, that's not that. That would give you a, a factor of two loss here in in the estimate. So the, actually, the sharp example is is a, a so-called cigar soliton metric of Hamilton, um, which is a, a little bit better, but I don't think maybe we should get into that now. How are we doing on time? So, yeah, okay. Right. <coughs> Another th maybe thing to point out is that there is no boundary assumption here at all. Okay, so we're doing 
Oh, so I better make sure <laughs> for that to be true, I better make sure that we do an interior estimate. Okay. So the notion of a solution is not an issue here. Though. Everything's smooth. Not the initial data. Uh, yeah. Just make. Uh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. 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 In the theorem, everything take everything to be smooth, and then you are in the nicest situation, which has all the content. You can then do approximations uh, a, a, as you see fit. So you, even u zero take to be smooth. When I say it's in L one, I just mean if you integrate that smooth function, you get something bounded, right? Not that you're not too irregular on the interior. <coughs> All right. Um, yeah, so there's no boundary, there's no boundary assumption, which is again something to do with the nonlinearity of the, of, it, it, it's to do with this nonlinearity of this equation. Uh, this sort of thing would be impossible. To, we're getting local estimates here, purely local estimates, which eventually can be applied to any Ricci flow in an arbitrary chart. You couldn't possibly hope for lower bounds of the same form. That would just work the wrong way around. So um, given any, solu any initial data, there would be a solution which just disappears to nothing in as short a time as you, as you like. So this is a complete contrast to that. So let's quickly um, give you a slightly more geometric form of the equation, and then we'll say a few words about the proof. So to see the more geometric form of the equation, we have to consider the uh, metric that I was talking about earlier, the Poincaré metric, the, you know, the standard. So I, I can put metric in, in, in quotes here because I'm really considering the conformal factor. So as I wrote down before, this is 1 minus mod x squared squared. So that would have, that would be a metric of constant Gauss curvature minus one. Okay, so it looks something like this on the ball. And if you evolve that under Ricci flow, it will just lift up. So instead of being multiplied by a smaller and smaller number and shrinking to nothing, it would actually be multiplied by one plus two t, it would actually expand. Okay, so that's worth bearing in mind. Um, <coughs> So I have to think of a way of streamlining this a little bit. So let's do um, a slight variant on this theorem one, theorem two, still with Hao Yin. And it says that um, under these same assumptions here, but not this L1 here, assumption here, I'm going to make it a little bit different. So we're going to say if u0 minus the hyperbolic metric positive part is an L1. In fact, uh, any scaling for hyperbolic metric. So let's take that to be the case. So alpha is just some scaling. So if, if we're in L1, then more or less the same conclusion. So if t is big enough, and now it's going to be the L1 norm of this quantity that's in L1, of course. Oh, so it's still divided by 4 pi. And then just go on a little bit beyond. Then we get as a conclusion, now on the whole ball, that we're lying underneath C T plus alpha. H. So now that's existing on the whole ball, not, this is not even an interior estimate anymore. So what, what is this saying? Uh, sort of running a little bit out of time, but let, let me try and summarize. So what it's saying is, so you've got this hyperbolic metric which evolves nicely by expanding. And it's saying if you take any other metric, even if it's got some really sharp points, then eventually this expanding hyperbolic metric will overtake the other one in some sense. At least if you scale it a bit, it'll sort of overtake. Okay, so this is not something you can get from the tried and tested maximum principle. It's, uh, it's more subtle, but it's, um, yeah, anyway. 
Okay. Right. So I think we should probably say something about the uh, the proof. So why is it true that for a definite time interval, I definitely don't have any upper bound on my u, but after this specific time, then I do. So why why is you know what's the mechanism that's making that work? That's what I try want to try and explain. So after after a, a shorter than this time, we won't have any L infinity control on this. We won't even have any LP control on that. Okay. As soon as we ever knew that we had LP control on that, then the LP L infinity smoothing will kick in instantly and give us L infinity bounds immediately. So for some reason, there's no LP control for a, a definite amount of time, and then suddenly you get um, this nice L infinity control. So let me try and sort of s summarize some of the ideas in the proof. So what we end up doing is defining a potential which is derived, so let's call it psi zero, it's derived f from solving the equation. Uh, let, let's just restrict to the alpha equals one case. Solving the equation as follows. So this is now going to be on the ball, and we're going to take zero boundary data for our potential. Yeah, is, so in the in the example you gave at the beginning, uh, this say you, you, your result would mean time immediately after the lifetime of the of the compact solution. Uh, the example you mean in the shrinking sphere? Right. Uh, no, because that will be out by a factor of two. So if, if you want one that showed that this is sharp, then you should take the cigar salt on and scale it properly. So if you scale the cigar salt, uh, uh, maybe a, that's sort of s slightly different metric, which geometrically is like a, a half cylinder which has been capped off. And if you choose that correctly, then it's a so-called steady salt on. Under the equation, at a later time, it would be isometric to the original solution, but it's not static solution in the sense that it would be isometric via a, <coughs> not the identity. Um, so if you scale that in the right way, then exactly what you say is true. So, yeah, at that particular time, it would, that delta mass, the way you, have, the way you would end up scaling it, the delta mass would disappear. Okay. So, um, I'm going to have to sort of paint this in broad brushes for lack of time, but what you end up doing is you consider a potential, which is actually a slight variant on this. A slight variant which is sort of, um, it's a quantity which you would consider when you're studying Kähler geometry, in fact, though we don't have to worry about that at all. It would be basically this nice simple potential plus something that you can control. Actually, we, we have to actually come up with a, a particular instance of a so-called Kähler potential um, because we're working locally. But we end up cooking up a potential, which we call phi, I mean, let's just be very rough, which is sort of like this, plus something which blows up in a very prescribed way, infinity. And then we let that evolve under uh, the PDE, which looks a little bit like the logarithmic fast diffusion equation, only the log and the Laplacian are the wrong way around. So you end up with this equation, um, which is a, a something that would crop up in Kähler geometry, in fact. And uh, in some sense, in this, what you have to be uh, very careful, which you don't normally have to do, um, to make sure you have the right boundary conditions, which actually is boundary growth condition. So then you look at this evolution, and then there's a Harnack inequality, which we, we could borrow from a, uh, a relatively recent paper of two guys from Toulouse, Gurdj and Zeri Hai, I don't know how you say his name. And um, we adapted that, what they did to our situation in the local case, and it ends up giving you a Harnack estimate on a sort of evolved potential of this. So 
for our purposes today, I can tell you what we managed to extract from that Harnack inequality, and uh, that, that will be enough, I think. So what we managed to extract is that at a later time u, at any time, not at time beyond some magic threshold, at any later time, we get an estimate which is like e to the solution of this original potential divided by t. So, so this is going to be true on b a half. So you don't have to worry about all the derivation for today. All you have to think about is this, these two bits in boxes. So can't get a simpler PD than that. Can't really get a much simpler estimate than that. It's kind of not nice because the right-hand side here now magically only involves the potential at time zero. Uh, it's actually the H, this hyperbolic okay. guy, right? So I, uh, the way you prove it is to do this, take this slightly more geometric version, right? You can think of it, I mean, locally it would be, um, you know, alpha H would be a little bit like K, right? So you're, but it's just convenient to be able to work globally. And H actually, it's like a K which blows up infinity, right? <coughs> so what are we going to do with this estimate? So let's have a look at um, this PDE. So I've only got a couple of minutes left. But um, this quantity here, by assumption, is an L1. So we get an estimate here. We're in two dimensions, which doesn't quite put us in W21 and L infinity. If we were in L infinity, then this would be an L infinity. This would be bounded. So we would already be bounded. So actually, you know, if you... <laughs> If you could get a W21 estimate off, a, you know, off the borderline case for elliptic theory, then you wouldn't have this sort of shrinking sphere example. Okay, so it's completely concrete. On the other hand, there's an estimate of um, which in this setting uh, would normally be attributed to Brazis and Mel. It's super, super simple, very pretty indeed. It only takes a few lines to prove. And it says basically, if you have an equation like this, where you have Laplacian of something is an L1 function, then <coughs> you get exponential, uh, well, uh, th there are various exponential integrability statements, as you all know, uh, for psi. But the one we need is the one written in, in the Brazis Mel paper. And it will say, <coughs> um, so what it says is that if you, of minus Laplacian eta is f in L1 and eta zero on the boundary, then um, if your exponent p is less than 4 pi over, it would be the L1 norm of f, then you'd get e to the eta in Lp. Okay, so that's what we can apply here. So we're going to apply it. So eta is not going to be psi 0. Let's just divide through by um, <coughs> t. May as well. And then this will be our eta, and this will be our f. So if you unravel what that, um, what that actually says, <coughs> then it says that if, just in one line, if t is bigger than this magic threshold number, then the exponential of psi 0 over t is in Lp for p bigger than 1. That's probably the cleanest way of saying it. <clears throat> so you have to get to that threshold time. Then this quantity is in Lp. And that's exactly what you have the right hand side of this estimate. So at that point, you're in LP, and the LP L infinity smoothing kicks in. So you're immediately in L infinity as well. In fact, that's not what we do, because the LP L infinity smoothing estimates that are in the literature are a little bit weaker than what we can deduce from our estimate. So in fact, we go, we just sort of do a double bootstrap here. We get this in LP, and then we just do the same argument again and get uh, L infinity bounds. And that works out 
uh, nicely. So that gives you a sort of idea of uh, the proof's not, not, not that tricky. Um, I was going to explain how you get the, the nice LP, L infinity smoothing. It only takes a few lines, but I think I'm out of time. You'll have to read it in the paper. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions, comments? For uniqueness, you need a lower bound, which you get from completeness, I guess. Yeah. Are you going back to the beginning yeah. theorem? All right. You need a lower bound, which you get from completeness. Is exactly what you say. Right. And they match. Exactly. They exactly. It exactly gives you the lower bound that you need. Right. Right. Because without exactly. Right. How do you get the Harnack bound? Sorry. How do you get the Harnack bound? Uh, so how do you get it? So um, you have to find the right quantity, which is a combination of psi and its derivatives, which then, which we could borrow, this is exactly the bit that we borrowed from, I, I'm not even sure what the first paper was considered this, but this is the paper we got it from. Um, uh, once you've got this quantity, you can look at the evolution equation uh, for that, uh, but there you've got to be a little bit careful, you've got to make sure you're doing the geometric thing. You, it's no good looking at the evolution equation in R2, you've got to look at the evolution equation in hyperbolic space. So if you do that, then you can apply the maximum principle. You can show that that Harnack quantity, by the way that we cook up our potential infinity, you can show that it actually vanishes infinity. All you'd need, in fact, there is that it would be bounded or it wouldn't grow too badly infinity. But then, the, um, then you can argue that that particular quantity that you cook up is zero initially um, and satisfies a nice parabolic partial differential inequality. So it ends up having a sign. And then when you consider the consequences of that, you get this. But you've got, you've got to think of that quantity. You've got, you've got to have that quantity at hand, right? Otherwise, it's more tricky. Right. So you mentioned a little bit of the geometric applications. Can you say a few, a few more words? Yeah, so, um, so well, there, there, there are several applications. But the one that I was um, alluding to earlier is, right, so starting Ricci flow with rougher initial data. So what sort of rough data might you consider? So in practice, when you're actually using Ricci flow, you might end up having to consider uh, data which is a limit of smooth guys. So a limit of smooth manifolds is just nothing in general. But in practice, you're trying to prove a theorem about maybe manifolds with Ricci curvature bounded below, for instance. In this situation, it would be Ricci, it would be Gauss curvature bounded below, that would be. So if you take a sequence of such manifolds, then again, you don't have smoothness in the limit, but there is a, a nice theory of convergence of such objects to metric spaces with lots of structure. So Alexandrov spaces or variants of Alexandrov spaces, you know, there's lots of flexibility in the actual theorem you write down. So, um, so these metric spaces that you, you end up considering, you can view as ultimately, by work of people like Reshetnyak, you can view them as Riemann surfaces with conformal factors U that have very low regularity. So how would you flow something like that? Well, you'd think, oh, well, it's a parabolic equation, so I can just flow it. But of course, the, we've just seen, you know, delta functions don't smooth out. You don't get smoothing in general. So you need to make sure that you can take this sort of L1 type data and, and flow it. So of course, the way you do it is to smooth it, approximate it by smooth guys, flow all the smooth guys, which by our theorem just will just exist typically for all time. But you need estimates to pass the limit. And the estimates you need are the L1 and infinity smoothing estimate that we prove. And, and what about in high dimension, Ricci flow in high dimension? Is there any, any hope of having something? Uh, well, there is, I mean, it depends which bit you want to extrapolate. So certainly the idea that you try to consider metric spaces that are limits of smooth guys with various geometric conditions, because, you know, maybe the goal is to prove results, geometric results about 
manifolds with you know Ricci curvature bound below and you know volume growth of a certain behavior or whatever. So you know in an argument, in a contradiction argument, you know it might be trying to prove something about such objects. So you'd end up saying, well, if if it's not true, then you'd end up with a sequence where the Ricci curvature is, you know, um, bound has a uniform bound, etc., etc. Then you'd end up having to pass to a limit and then consider the Ricci flow with that limit. So this is something that is does actually work. So Miles Simon is the pioneer in that sort of line of work. Um, it works in so Miles Simon. So. Um, yeah, so on the other hand, there, there's still really a lot, a lot to be done. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting subject, actually. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. Oh, uh, last question. Uh, about the second theorem, uh, as time goes to infinity, can you say that uh, you decay to the expanding uh, metabolic metric or, or not? Yeah, right. So, um, but this is a much more general statement, which I was sort of alluding to um, when Sergio was asking his question before. So the theorem says the following. You give me, so I already gave you a theorem that says you can always flow any surface. Um, if you give me a surface which, well, look at its conformal type. It's either has the universal cover hyperbolic space or the plane or S2 by the uniformization theorem. If it's hyperbolic, which is almost every case, if it's a, in other words, if there exists a hyperbolic metric, then our theorem always says you have existence for all time. And it says, uh, but then there's another theorem which says if you divide by, uh, if you divide g of t by 2t, so scale down, then that will always converge smoothly locally to the hyperbolic guy. Right. So yes, is the answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.